We're speaking on Friday, August 2nd with Mark Zandi, chief economist at Moody's. And we'll be talking about the jobs market, the economy. Mark, welcome to the show. Good to see you. Good to be with you, David. Thanks for the opportunity. Risk assets are in distress today on the, on, on the 2nd of August as the jobs report came out. A bit weaker than expected. The unemployment rate ticked up to 4.3%. My first question is whether or not we're in a recession per the Psalms rule supposedly being triggered today. Well, a uh, literal interpretation of the Psalms rule would say, yeah, we are. I think the, what is it? The You take a three-month moving average of the unemployment rate, look at the current unemployment rate compared to its low point over the past 12 months. If that's risen by more than half a percentage point, you're already in recession by a couple, three months. And we got, that was triggered today. Uh, so a literal interpretation would say, yeah, but I, I doubt it. I don't think so. I, I think uh, one of the key reasons why unemployment rate the unemployment rate is up, is labor supply. We've got a lot of immigrants coming into the country. They're applying for work, getting work. So that's juicing up supply. Uh, there's been some weakening in demand, but that's been to script. That's the Federal Reserve raising interest rates, trying to cool things off. Uh, but the fact that unemployment's up uh, so much due to labor supply takes the edge off uh, the meaning of the increase in unemployment. The other thing I point out is the best coincident indicator of, of a recession is jobs, the payroll employment. And even though it was up weekly in the month of uh, July, 114K, on a three-month moving average basis, kind of underlying a monthly job growth about 150K, that's still very good and not consistent with recession. So I, I suspect the SOM, I, I, I'd say quite strongly, SOM rule is, uh, got it wrong this time. Uh, uh, we're not in recession. What would make you think we're in a recession? Uh, if we start losing jobs, uh, if employment started to fall in a consistent way, uh, that would be- uh, Well, sorry, know, I, I thought I thought the unemployment rate ticking up is already indicative of losing jobs, but- No, it's, it's no. not. It's, okay. it's because you got more labor supply. You got the labor, mm. you got all these folks coming into the workforce looking for work and find, many of them finding work, but uh, that's why unemployment's up. It's about the supply. It's not about demand. So we're still creating a boatload of jobs- uh, less the job growth is slow, no doubt. But again, that's largely so far been by design. Uh, so the uh, demand is is uh, is softening, but uh, it, you know we're still creating a lot of jobs. So no, we're not we're not even near recession. Before we continue with the interview, I want to tell you about another way you can invest your bitcoins and store them safely instead of using a traditional wallet or an exchange. Consider an IRA. Today's sponsor, iTrust Capital, is one such IRA that offers 35 crypto assets and the lowest trading fees in the crypto IRA space at 1% only. And being an IRA, it also offers unique tax benefits. If you'd like to get started and learn more, click on itrust.capital slash David in the link down below or scan the QR code up here. If you're over 18 and you want to open a new account with cash or roll over an existing account, you can do so using my referral link. And if you use that referral link, you'll get $100 in signing bonuses. What about uh, hiring slowing down uh, this past week? Uh, Non-farms payrolls added fewer fewer jobs than I guess the previous week. Is that is that a worrying indicator for you or is that too volatile? Well, it's showing the economy is throttling back. The labor market is slowing. Uh, I mean, job growth is uh, moderating. I, again, I think underlying job growth, abstracting from the vagaries of the data, it's probably about 150,000 per month. And most of the reason for that slowing in job creation is uh, is uh, less hiring. So businesses have become more cautious in their hiring. Now, some of it may also be hiring may also be done because people aren't quitting. Uh, you know, everyone quit their jobs en masse a couple, three years ago when we were coming out of the pandemic and labor markets were very tight and folks found jobs that are better suited to their skills, talent, they got better paying jobs and are in, in no mood or interest to move. So if people aren't moving, then you don't need to hire as much. But even having said that, I, I suspect hiring is down a bit because labor demand is softened. But again, David, I mean, this is what the Fed wanted. They wanted labor demand to cool off to bring in wage growth and, and inflation. Just one other quick point, wage growth, which is also in the report, you know, the average hourly earnings, that was up 3.6% year over year. That's right down the strike zone. That's exactly where you'd want it to see, want it to be if you were at the Fed. You know, strong enough that's creating real after inflation wage gains to keep consumers in the game and spending, but not so strong that it would, you know, cause businesses to push prices up and uh, cause higher inflation. So, we're, you know, exactly where you'd want to see it. You know what's uh, remarkable is today I'm looking at the uh, CME Fed Watch tool. Uh, about an hour ago, well, two hours ago actually, it was an 80% chance that we'll get a 50 basis point cut. I saw that in September. Yeah. 
Now it's down to 70%. But anyway, the, the, it was remarkably yeah. higher than the previous day. And of course, much higher than when the FOMC made the announcement on Wednesday. What's up with that, Mark? Well, uh, you know, I, and I would agree with the investors here. I think the Fed has been slow to cut interest rates. In fact, I would, I, if I were at the Fed, I'd been arguing for great cuts at the start of the year. So they've been taking a chance with the economy and, and, I, and I think uh, inappropriately. So I think they've achieved their objectives. Uh, so they've kept the rates too high for too long, and that's what markets are saying. And they're saying now the Fed has to play catch up, meaning they got to start cutting rates. Uh, and they're not going to cut rates before September, but once they do start cutting rates at September, they need to be more aggressive in those rate cuts. So not a quarter point cut, which is where we were, you know, this time last week, but a fifty basis point cut. Now, you know, these the CME markets that the the the, the uh, data you're looking at that that sentiment swings very wildly, you know, minute to minute. So I'm, I'm not sure I'd read too much into it, but I would concur with the sentiment. I think the Fed's, uh, you know, behind the curve here, so to speak, it really needs to play catch up and should cut rates 50 basis points in September. I doubt they'll do that. Uh, you know, of course, it depends on the data between now and then. I doubt they'll do it. But in my view, uh, I'm on. I'm on the same page with investors. I think they should. It's interesting because the Fed, uh, at the FOMC press conference, a reporter asked Jerome Powell uh, point blank, is it on the table if the basis point cut by September? He says, no, we're not considering that. Um, why are you in the same camp as investors? Because you made this tweet uh, not too long ago. You said, I don't want to jinx anything, but what a fantastic week for the economy. Real strong GDP growth. Inflation that is arguably already consistent with the Fed's target. We'll talk about inflation in just a minute, Mark. Most encouraging, it appears the economy's growth potential is much higher than is commonly thought. Um, consider the half percentage point increase in the unemployment rate over the past year. The Fed should begin cutting rates. Okay, well... If the economy is already doing well, um, and the, the you know inflation is on the right track, why do we need cuts? Um, you know, it seems like we're getting a Goldilocks scenario whereby inflation is coming down and the economy isn't tipping over. Well, no, the, I mean the economy is weakening. Uh, all the trend lines uh, suggest further weakening unless the Fed lets up on the brakes here. So, you know, the economy can only digest a five and a half percent funds rate target, which is where we are for so long. I mean, I think there's a lot of debate as to what the appropriate funds rate should be. You know, that equal, so-called equilibrium rate or start that's the rate that's uh, consistent with policy, neither supporting or restraining growth. But it's not five and a half percent. Maybe it's four. You know, maybe it's three and a half, but it's not five and a half. And if you keep rates at five and a half, which is what the Fed's been doing for more than a year now, you run the risk of breaking something and you're starting to see, you know, the fault lines in the economy uh, begin to, to shake and saw today in the job market, it's shaking. You can feel it in the financial system. The yield curve is still inverted. Banks are still under, and non-banks are still under a lot of pressure. You know, there's liquidity issues in the bond market. So, you know, things are shaking. So it's incumbent on the Fed to get moving here. Now, last week's data was fantastic. It's great. We're doing good. Let's just keep it going, please. And so, but that requires the Fed to, you know, start normalizing interest rates, getting them back down to something that's more, more consistent with where we are, a full employment economy with inflation back at target. How important is a Fed decision by September for the economy? There seems to be a lot of obsession with the Fed cut in the next two months. Does it really matter, Mark? It does. I think I think it does. I mean, if, if, first of all, it matters with regard to expectations. I mean, if investors begin to think the Fed's not going to cut rates or is going to wait longer to cut rates, then stocks are going to sell off, bond yields are going to rise, uh, credit spreads will gap out. That's a problem. You know, financial conditions will tighten inappropriately so. So they've got to be, the Fed at this point has to make it very clear that they're going to stick to script here and start cutting interest rates. And I, if I, again, if I were them, I'd start intimating that, you know, 50 basis points on the table. Jay Powell made that statement before he saw today's jobs report. You know, if you asked him that the same question today, I'd be I'd be somewhat surprised if he didn't answer, oh yeah, 50 basis points is on, you know, I maybe I don't think that's going to happen, but that's definitely something we're going to discuss. So, you know, I do think they really, uh, you know, sh should start to move here uh, and, and start uh, pushing r rates down. Otherwise, uh, they, they, we are going to have a problem, uh, you know, so uh, uh, the economy is going to struggle. Let's talk about um, equity markets reaction to today's uh, labor report. The VIX shot up 56 percent this morning, Mark. Why was there so much fear, uncertainty, if you want to call that? What, what happened today? Well, I, a couple things. I mean, I think the market is very certainly coming into today, very richly valued. You know, uh, the stock prices are at record highs, have been hitting record highs pretty consistently throughout the year. You know, some of the tech stocks have just been going gangbusters. Uh, but the entire market, PE multiples or price earnings multiples, measure of valuation are consistent with a highly 
richly valued market. There's some signs of speculation creeping in the market. So the market was already vulnerable to any news that wasn't exactly to script. And that's the second reason why it sold off today. Today's data was not to script. I mean, it shows an economy that's weakening more than anticipated. And it's at, soon after the Fed said, hey, we're not cutting rates until September. So that's a long time to go before the Fed starts cutting interest rates. And hopefully, again, they will in September. But, uh, you know, I think the markets are trying to digest that. Uh, now, you know, uh, this, we're, we're talking on the same day uh, that the market's down. I'm looking at the Dow down 800 points. Let's see where it ends up in the next hour. As you know, David, the market's going to end in a very different place than where they began. And let's just see. And, and we've been going through this kind of jigsaw up and down all around here for the past couple, three weeks. So you can have a really bad day one day and a really good day the next. People are definitely buying on the dip. So I'm not sure I'd read too much in today's action, but the action makes a lot of sense in the context of uh, high valuations uh, and uh, an economy that's not uh, sticking the script. The Atlanta Fed GDP now forecast for the next quarter is 2.5%. Um, is this in line with your expectations? Yeah, it's pretty early in the quarter. And the uh, you know the GP the these the now casts are based on all the you know monthly data, weekly data that come in. Uh, and so far we've gotten very little data. So that I'm not sure how much weight I put on two and a half percent, but that makes a lot of sense. I mean, we grew two percent annualized, I think two point one percent annualized to be precise in the first half of the year. So if you said two and a half percent, I you know it sounds right to me. I, I do think we will see some further slowing here, though. Uh, you know, if the, again the, the monetary policy, policy the five and a half percent funds rate target is starting to bite, some of the fiscal support that really helped support the economy's growth last year, you know, the Chips Act and the inf and the um, the infrastructure legislation and parts of the Inflation Reduction Act, we, we're providing a lot of support to business investment and uh, infrastructure spending. That's going to cool off a little bit, and I suspect uh, you know the stock market. You know, valuations are high. I don't expect it to go anywhere very fast, and we could see a correction. Wouldn't be too surprising given the run-up, and that's going to take some steam out of consumer spending because most of the action in terms of spending is folks at the high end of the income distribution, wealth distribution, and they, they're focused on their 401k and stock portfolios. And if, you don't, if they start seeing more red than green, that might have an impact. So, you know, add all that up. I expect to see growth slow. I, one of the important point, though, David, and it, it was in that quote you or that tweet you uh, that you read. The economy's potential growth is probably a lot higher. You know, it can grow a lot more without generating inflationary pressures because of all the immigration coming into the country. That's lifting labor supply, getting back to the unemployment rate. And the other thing, positive thing, is productivity growth is very strong. You know, I don't know if it's sustainable, but right now we're growing two and a half percent. So that would suggest the economy's potential rate of growth is well over three, probably close to 4% GDP. And that would also explain why unemployment's rising in the context of strong GDP growth, because the economy's potential is very strong. Therefore, you know, the Fed, another reason for the Fed to ease up here, because they're choking off growth that, you know, you know is very counterproductive because the economy can grow stronger without uh, generating inflationary pressures. There's been a rotation ever since the middle of July. The S&P 500, large caps, NASDAQ, large cap companies have been going down ever since the beginning, uh, you know, beginning of the month or middle of the month, rather. Are you in the camp that the equity markets are sniffing out a correction in the economy, the real economy? I, I, again, it goes, I think it goes back to valuations, right? I mean, because you know, the large cap, and I'm here, I'm getting a little bit out of my element, but large cap stock value, stock price have really run up quite a bit. Valuations are very high. Small cap stocks have kind of lag behind. So I think it's more of a valuation play, particularly in the context of falling interest rates. If you believe that the Fed's going to start cutting interest rates, that's probably going to help the smaller companies more than the bigger guys. The bigger guys, they did a pretty good job locking in the record low interest rates that prevailed previously. In fact, if you look at total corporate interest payments, they're, they really haven't risen at all relative to cash flows since the Fed started tightening monetary policy. But for the small guys, their debt is, you know, much rolls over a lot more quickly tied to prime because a lot of it might be, you know, and prime is tied to the federal funds rate. So they're paying a lot higher interest rates. So if rate, if the Fed, if the Fed starts cutting interest rates and that it, and the pressure on interest ex expense starts to uh, uh, moderate, that will benefit small companies more than larger companies. So I, I suspect it, it's more about valuation and some of the more fundamental reasons why, you know, we're seeing this rotation. I want to get to your... Um research on election outcomes and the economy and economic impacts of that. Uh, but first, just, let me just ask you this. Your chief economist in Moody's, you talk to a lot of people, a lot of market participants, investors, economists. What, per your consensus, are some of the biggest concerns right now that you've been hearing regarding the economy? 
Well, interestingly, David, uh, you know, when I give a talk or a speech, one of the first things I do is ask, what's bothering you? What can I help you with? Because I'd like to get a sense of the audience, you know, what, what's, what's bugging them? And invariably, r- most recently, it's been so-called geopolitical risk, uh, you know, which is a kind of a catch-all for I'm just worried about everything that's going on out there. And there's a lot of things to, you know, obviously that to worry about Russia, Ukraine, you got US, China, you got North Korea, you got Iran, you got Hamas, Israel, you know, a lot of a lot of moving parts and all of that makes uh, pretty for a pretty noxious mix in people's minds. And so I think that's what, you know, right now is really bugging people. I will say, uh, you know, uh, there's always geopolitical risk, and it's often very hard to connect the dots back to the U.S. economy. Like, you know, what what exactly would be the macroeconomic fallout from uh, what's going on in the Middle East? It's, it's probably oil prices. That's the that's the channel, but it's hard you're hard pressed to figure out what else it would be. And right now, oil prices are down. I mean, they're I look at today. This too is probably overstated given the market action, but we're in the 70s. You know that's pretty low by any standard. And then increasingly, I will say, increasingly top of mind is the election. Uh, that you know straight ahead of us, a lot of angst around that. Uh, and uh, you know, particularly interestingly enough, with uh, the uh, with President Biden withdrawing from the race and Vice President Harris, I just learned today she was now the official nominee of the Democratic Party. Uh, th- that does. This, uh, mean that this election is going to be very close uh, and probably contested and may not be decided for quite some time. You know, it could go into the courts, Supreme Court may decide. And, you know, unlike uh, the, the last time the election went into the courts in, in the election, B- Bush versus Gore, you know, I don't know that anyone here is going to step down gracefully. Of course, step down and, you know, resolve that that uh, that standoff pretty quickly. I don't know that, that that's going to happen this go around. So I think that's top of mind. And then, you know, on the other side of the election, things like the debt limit, what are we going to do with the tax cuts that expire? You know, there's a whole slew of other fiscal policy issues. And then ultimately, the, the thing that every, every single time I give a, a talk and I ask what's bugging you, someone says deficits and debt. You know, this is a, is this a problem for our economy in the longer run? Speaking of deficits and debt, the uh, U.S. national debt surpassed $35 trillion, reported on the 29th of July, so this week. Um, to what extent is this going to be a problem? I mean, the debt just goes up in nominal terms every year anyway. Yeah, it's a problem. Uh, you know, if things don't change, if policy doesn't change, I mean, the Congressional Budget Office, the CBO, the folks that do this for a living, the nonpartisan group that does it for a living, you know, say, okay, the nation's publicly traded debt to GDP ratio is today is 100%. By the way, that's more than double what it was before the financial crisis. So that gives you a sense of context. We're 100%. And if we don't change policy, if we continue on with the current policy, which by the way, includes the expiration of the tax cuts. So more revenue, the debt to GDP ratio will be, I'm making up the numbers, David, but roughly speaking, 115% 10 years from now, 165, 70%. 30 years from now, that's when their forecast ends, but you can you can do your own forecast and it keeps on going. That That's not sustainable. Something's going to break. I mean, I think at least for a while, it's more of a corrosive on the economies than some kind of cliff event. You know, here's a good rule of thumb. For every percentage point increase in the debt to GDP ratio, that adds about a, per, a basis point to interest rates. So that's a corrosive. It, it's, it's not something that drives your economy into a ditch in, in any given year, but it kind of weighs on the economy's ability to grow. But at some point, there will be a cliff event. You know, investors are going to say, this doesn't make any sense. It's unsustainable. Probably will be around some debt limit battle or some other, you know, uh, uh, issue that uh, highlights how we're dysfunctional politically. We'll see some kind of uh, crisis in the bond market. Interest rates will gap out. Final thing I'll say on that, that it almost feels like that has to happen because unless we see, you know, some kind of crisis, unless bond investors kind of throw up on what's going on and say, I'm not buying your bonds at these interest rates. It's hard for lawmakers to connect the dots in the minds of the electorate between our deficits, debt, and what it means for our economy. So it may, in fact, need a crisis to generate the political will necessary to make the hard choices that we'll have to make. I mean, you know, restrain spending and and raise taxes. Okay, uh, let's talk about your report here. Uh, it's called the assessing. It's called assessing the macroeconomic consequences of Biden versus Trump. Now you wrote this in June, so obviously before um, Biden dropped out, and now we have Harris. Uh, and uh, we'll go over some of the key passages here. In one of your um, paragraphs, you wrote that uh, where you claim that inflation may be higher under a Republican sweep scenario. I mean, you have a chart that up on the screen that illustrates that chart eight inflation higher under a Republican sweep scenario. Can you explain this? 
Yeah, this Republican sweep scenario assumes President Trump, former President Trump, wins re, uh, wins the election in the Congress, Senate, and House uh, go Republican. So he he gets everything he says he wants, and we're assuming he gets everything he says he wants. You know, ten percent tariffs, sixty percent on China, deportation of immigration, tax cuts uh, are uh, are made permanent, uh, lower corporate tax rates. Uh, you know, rescind parts of the Inflation Reduction Act, particularly with regard to climate. Uh, mitigation, you know, all those things that he says he wants, uh, we include. Uh, uh, and we assume that, you know, they they happen uh, right away, you know, that uh, as soon as he takes office on January 20th, 2025, he gets what he wants, just to make the analysis more tractable. And that's inflationary, right? Because tariffs, you know, raise prices that are, that's just a direct increase on prices to tax on the American consumer, particularly lower income consumers. Deportation, you know, at least in the near term, that's inflationary because it exacerbates the labor market shortages in key sectors of the economy. If you're full at full employment, like we are, uh, the tax cuts, uh, you know, they help long run growth. You know, the uh, corporate tax rate. The near term, they're that's fiscal stimulus. They're deficit finance. They're paid to some degree by the tax, the the tariff revenue, but not all of it, not about half of it. And so that juices up uh, demand and growth and inflation in, in the near term. So you. You add all that up, that's inflationary. It also means the Fed is going to have to, uh, at the very least, be slower to cut rates, may even have to raise interest rates. And of course, that means ultimately slower growth for the economy. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a, the policy is kind of a negative supply shock, you know, that uh, generates more inflation and, and ultimately slower growth. I should back up a minute. Uh, you have here uh, four quadrants of four sectors or, you know, four sets of probability scenarios. Here. Scenarios. Yeah. Biden and divided Congress scenario, uh, 40% probability. Republican sweep, 35%. Uh, Trump divided Congress, 15%. Democratic sweep, 10%. First of all, have you updated these probabilities since uh, Harris now is taking- Yeah, a little bit. A little, yeah. not much. Uh, 45% Harris divided Congress, 35% uh, Trump, uh, the Republican sweep, uh, 15% Trump divided government, and uh, if memory serves, 5% Democratic sweep. So it's 50-50 if you add up- the scenarios where Harris is president or uh, and Trump, there it's 50-50. And a 60% probability we end up in, with some form of divided government. The divided government scenarios are where we get, you know, obviously less legislation. The lawmaker, the president, whether it be Harris or, or Trump, can't do nearly as much. Everything they're doing is under, most of everything they're doing is under executive order. Uh, and, you know, you can get a lot of stuff done under executive order. President Trump did that. So has President Biden in his term around tariffs and uh, on immigration. You can, you get uh, on uh, how to implement the Inflation Reduction Act, those kinds of things. So it, you get le a lot less done. You, it's much harder to get stuff done with regard to tax and spending policy. Uh, but uh, it's not like you can't get some some things, uh, uh, you know, cr across the transom and, and into um, uh, actually being implemented. Uh, which scenario would be most bullish for the stock markets? Uh, that's a tough one. Uh, in our in our uh, analysis, it's basically a draw. Uh, I mean, under the Republican sweep, uh, you, the stock market really benefits from the lower corporate tax rate. But it, it gets hurt by the higher inflation and interest rates. So the net of all that is kind of a wash. Under, uh, you know, like a, 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 a Harris divided uh, Congress, you know, nothing really gets done. So it's basically the status quo when you end up in roughly the same place as a Republican sweep. So I, I don't know that there's a material difference uh, between the stock market and the force. They're different. If you look at the numbers, you can see it in the, in the, in the work white paper, but they're not, I don't view them as materially different. You know, it's ironic that you bring up the probability or the possibility of it, you know inflation going up under a Republican sweep, but Trump has made it a, a, a priority on his campaign trail to quote unquote lower inflation. He even yeah. promised to bring down the gas price. How is he planning to do this? Well, you know, that's one thing that people uh, put, push back on in our analysis. They say uh, in these you know, the, the Trump folks and some of his supporters. Uh, drill, baby, drill. We're going to drill a lot more oil. We're going to, you know, ease up on regulation, and that's going to allow the fracking uh, frackers to pump a lot more oil, and that'll bring down global oil prices. Uh, uh, you know, I, I'm very skeptical of that argument. And first, because oil is not is a global it's determined in the global marketplace. It's not determined by U U.S. frackers. They, I mean, obviously, they pay, play a role, but you know. What's going on with Chinese oil demand? What's going on with the Saudi uh, and OPEC plus? What's going on with Russian sanctions? A lot of moving parts there. 
The other thing I'd say is, you know, uh, oil production has ramped up dramatically under President Biden. I mean, it, it's 13 and a half, I think it's 13 and a half million barrels a day, thir- between 13 and 13 and a half million barrels a day of oil from the fracking fields. That's up over a million barrels in the past, you know, 12, 18 months. That's pretty extraordinary. It's pretty hard to imagine that whatever President Trump does, he's going to be able to generate, you know, that kind of growth. And the final thing I would say is these frackers are very, very cautious about in putting more rigs into the ground. The ramp up in production we've seen so uh, under President Biden was the, was not putting more rigs in the ground. It was more about improving the productivity of the existing rigs. Uh, but, uh, you know, the frackers are very nervous, particularly if they think the strategy here is to get them to produce more oil to get prices down because they're just not going to make any money if prices go any, any lower than they are today. So they're not going to they're not going to do that. So I I hear that argument. I'm very I, I just don't get it. I don't know how that works. Uh, the president also talks about, you know, things that are other things that we haven't included that are would be inflationary. So, for example, he talks about lowering the value of the U.S. dollar right now. How? What what do you how do you do that? I'm not sure unless you you know somehow you capture the Fed and require them to run an easy monetary policy, lower interest rates. I, other than that, I, Treasury can't do it through intervention for any length of time. So I'm not really sure I understand. It, but that's inflationary, right? You lower the value of the dollar, you know, it's going to raise prices. So I, I you know I'm confused by that. So there's there's arguments, but you know that that I hear, but none of them resonate with me. Um, Ultimately, so then, are you con- are you concerned about the possibility of stagflation? It's brought up several times in my show, which is to say, higher inflation for perhaps longer and low economic growth. Well, that's kind of the flavor of the scenario where you get a Trump sweep if he gets exactly what he wants. Now, you could say he's not going to do what he says he's going to do, or he's not going to do it. You know, he's going to be directionally in that do that, but not to the degree. Or it's just political bluster negotiation, maybe. But the one thing I did, I've learned. I mean, yeah, we're we're assuming he's following. Yeah, the, but the one thing I, I've learned, and this is both Trump and Biden, whatever they said they were going to do, just go back and look in 2016 and 2020. Whatever they said they were going to do, they pretty much did it. They pretty much did it. Maybe not exactly to the degree that they said they were going to do it, but they did exactly what they said. Were so I think it's very important to listen to what they say and take them at face value because uh, you you made a mis- you would have made a mistake if you didn't do that in 2016 or 2020. I, I think uh, ultimately for investors watching the show, would, would, would they allocate capital differently under each of these scenarios? Yeah, well, I'm talking macro, right? We're talking big picture. I mean, under the hood, absolutely, there's big differences, right? Because uh, uh, for different industries and for different companies, think about tariffs. The way the tariffs were implemented under President uh, Trump you, you had a committee. Uh, I'm making, you know, this is roughly right, but they, there was a committee that sat there and decided uh, whether if a company was petitioning and said the tariffs were onerous to the to, to the country's economy for X Y Z reason, the committee would say, okay, uh, don't charge a tariff on this. Charge you can charge a tariff on that over this period of time with these countries. And of course, when you start doing that kind of stuff, someone's a winner, someone's a loser, and it has implications for investing. And also just regulation, you know, regulation of the banking industry, you know, Basel three end game, uh, the healthcare industry, the, you know, what's AI, the whole thing about crypto and Bitcoin and SEC, uh, antitrust policy. So, yeah, there, there's lots of, you know, things under the hood, lots of winners and losers. So you got to pay really close attention, but that's not a, those aren't in the grand scheme of things. They all wash out. It's not a macro event. That's more, you know, in the weeds. Finally, I want to close off on housing. It's another sector that you will look at closely. So yeah. according to the National Association of Realtors uh, reports, um, existing home sales prices rose 4.1% year over year. Um, and uh, studies from Zillow and bank rates also show that the Americans uh, need an annual income of at least $100,000 to afford a typical home now. That's a 50 to 80% increase from 2020. What's contributing to this rising unaffordability crisis, if you want to call it that? Lack of supply. I mean, interest, so-called interest like rate lock is part of it. I mean, uh, homeowners locked in when rates were low. They refied the average coupon on an existing mortgage was at one point closing in on three percent. So if you if current mortgage rates are right now they're six and a half, six and three quarters, and you have an, a, a mortgage that's sitting with three, three and a half percent, it doesn't make any economic sense for you to move. You, you know, there are some cases where your demographic situation has changed so much you have to move, but. You know, you have to be hard pressed to move. The other is supply issue is uh, the lack of home building, particularly for affordable 
rental and affordable home ownership at the low lower price points, you know, in the housing market. So you have you don't have supply uh, that all else being equal, that's higher prices, and and that's what we've seen. Uh, I think you've commented on this issue before. You wrote that uh, lawmakers uh, should complement this support to increase the supply of housing with targeted help for those looking to buy their first home. The most effective way to do this would be to allow renters to set up a tax-free savings account to save for a down payment, much like those set up for college savings under uh, Section 529 of the Internal Revenue Code. Can you elaborate on this plan? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, that, I wouldn't put that at the top of my list. That's on the list. I mean, I'm asked by policymakers, what should we be doing? And that's on the list of things that we should be doing. At the top of the list is we just build, baby, build, you know, uh, light low income housing tax credits for affordable rental, home neighborhood home tax credits for, to rehab uh, old housing stock in big urban centers. Uh, you know, Home Act uh, 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 grants for renovation, remodeling, and, and new new build again, all at the affordable end. So, you know, you got I would focus like a laser beam on that. But you know, down further, if we're starting to think longer term about trying to get renters to be homeowners and help them out, this would be a way to do it, right? You so you're a renter. The biggest impediment to buying a home is getting the down payment. Here's a way we the government would incent just like the you know, provide a tax break for, you know, 529 plans for a higher education, you give a tax uh, break to rent renters who save money for a down payment. Uh, they invest in the same way as a 529 plan. Uh, so they're saving, we want them to save and, uh, and they're preparing, but they're preparing uh, for uh, uh, the, that down payment and they're getting a subsidy from the federal government to do it. The idea is that we want folks with education, we want people with uh, uh, highly skilled, educated workers. We're going to, as a nation, subsidize that, make it easier for people to do that. And we want people to be homeowners because we feel, and I think generally we all feel, uh, that you know, being a homeowner means that you're more involved in your community, you're more involved in your job, you're more jo- involved in the nation's well-being because you have a stake in that in the nation. Not that renters don't, but as a homeowner, that your money's sitting right there and you want to make sure that it's money good. And so we want people to be homeowners who so want to make it easier for them to do that. But we want them to, you know, we're not, it's not a grant. It's, you know, you got to work for, you got to work and you got to save. We're just going to help you choose up the returns on that saving. Uh, final question. I'll let you go, Mark. Great talk. Uh, your outlook on mortgage rates and housing markets. Uh, there's been concern that a lot of homeowners can't survive mortgage rates at current levels. The Fed will need to cut soon and mortgage rates will need to follow soon. But we know that consumer credit rates typically lag Fed funds rate anyway. So is there an issue with foreclosures coming up, you think? No. I mean, because these are all 30-year, 15-year fixed mortgages. No. Uh, it's not Canada. It's not UK. It's not Canada. By the way, David, this is the biggest difference between the United States and the rest of the world and why the U.S. economy is held up better than anywhere else on the planet is because we all locked in here in the U.S. You can't lock in in Canada. What is it, a five-year mortgage? UK is five years. Scandinavia is two years, I think. That's why they're, they were in recession. So that's the big difference. So no, I, I'm not worried about that at, in, at all. There's no, no, no credit. Rate. And there's so much equity that's been built up in these homes. House prices have risen so much that the, the overall loan-to-value ratio, you know, that's the the loans relative to the value of the housing is the, probably the lowest it's ever been in the data that we have back to World War II. So there's a boatload of equity. Everyone's locked in. Right now, hopefully everyone keeps their job. So no, I'm not worried about that. Are, are you concerned about home prices slowing down in terms of growth? Yeah, they'll slow. They'll, 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 you know, what will happen here is as mortgage rates come in and they'll normalize. Normalize means that the fixed mortgage rate is going to be somewhere between five and a half and six. So we're about a hundred basis points away from normal uh, people's thinking about what the right, what a normal mortgage rate will shift. It's not three and a half percent. It's going to be five and a half percent. And once that, you know, they, their thinking shifts and also their demographics change, uh, you know, div- death, divorce, education, I mean, um, job change, uh, you know, uh, the, all those things mean that your housing needs will change. And the combination of a shift in expectations with regard to future mortgage rates combined with these demographic pressures will mean more people start to list their homes, interest rate lock will ease up, we'll see more supply, and that should take some pressure off the housing market. I don't think we'll see you know, kind of broad-based declines, but if you told me national house prices kind of went flat for a couple, three years, that sounds about right to me. That means some price declines in some markets, but on average, kind of basically flat. Fantastic, Mark. Thank you very much for your time. Where can we learn more about you or read your work? 
Yeah, oh, yeah. So uh, I'm the Moody's chief economist. Uh, you know, if you're really interested, go to e Economic View. It's uh, we put it's real time. We tr track all the indicators. A lot of commentary, blogs. Uh, you talked about the uh, Atlanta tracker, uh, GDP mm -hmm. tracker. We have one that we we uh, have. We tr it's, and this is global. It's all around the world. We got economists all over the over the planet. So if you're interested in our work, uh, I think I would go there. Okay, I think you're other so the co-host of a podcast if i'm not mistaken i am oh thank you yeah i appreciate that uh not not nearly as as widely listened to as yours we're uh, uh we we have nothing i'm sure you got these market guys that are very fascinating interesting. i only get these boring economies <laughs> <That's not true. laughs> including me <laughs> including me uh and uh it's called inside economics but we really you know, have a lot of, i have personally a lot of fun with it and we actually just recorded a session um, earlier today on the jobs numbers. So if you really want to go down deep, 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 deep into the numbers, uh, that that's a, the Inside Economics podcast is for you. Yeah, my audience loves uh, diving down deep in the rabbit hole. So okay, we'll the, we'll, there you go. We'll put the link in the description below. I think it's on the Moody's website. So we'll put, yeah, we'll put it down there. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, hey, Welcome to the program it. and uh, we'll speak again soon. Take care now. Have a great weekend. You too. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe.